I feel like I end up talking about change a lot, but it happens so frequently for us. It's happening in our industries, in our world, in our families, in our lives. It truly is the only constant that we have. Today, we are welcomed by CEO and founder of CHIP, Dana Wilson. Her and I reflect back on our careers in the financial industry and the time that we've spent and how much the industry has changed yet how much change really still needs to happen and why Dana launched CHIP, a resource, a technology vehicle, a website that allows individuals to find advisors of color, both black and Latinx advisors who kind of seem like a unicorn, as Dana puts it, in our industry that is very, as once so told by one of my other guests on the podcast, male, pale, and stale. And if you're male and pale, that doesn't mean you have to be stale, but in our industry, it tends to be that way and can be intimidating to start the conversation around money, which is why women advisors and people of color in our industry as advisors are so few and far between, yet so important for us to continue the conversation and important for us to evolve and grow. It's not just the hiring process. It's also the culture that we create at the firms that we work in. So join Dana and I as we talk about wealth, being women in the workplace, in a wealth industry, and Dana's experience as a black woman in the workforce as well. This is an incredible conversation and Dana is an absolute resource in our industry. And as I like to put it, a true trailblazer. So tune in and listen. Dana, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule, um, which I feel like busy is almost even an overused word, blessed schedule. Maybe we should use that word instead. To uh, coin it a little differently nowadays. It's like, we're all busy. (laughs) Now just kind of making time for all of the things that we have to do. But no, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. I was really looking forward um, to this. And I feel like I have to like redo my background a bit. <laughs> so, like, I love this bright yellow. Every time I see your background, I just feel like I want to go for a run or something. <laughs> it's oh, yay. Really exciting. Um, and, and makes you just wake up. So I, I appreciate the, the brightness and the, the brave and all of this stuff in the background. Yes, this is um, for those of you that are listening and not watching um, the video portion of it. My office is bright yellow on one wall. Thank you to the hubs who um, got a paintbrush (laughs) and a roller and he (laughs) painted it (laughs) Um, and him and my uh, eight-year-old or no, it was the younger, my six-year-old who hung all of the fun stuff on the wall because he does not let me near a hammer and a nail Ah. Anywhere close to his precious walls, I married a very, um, we'll just call him anal retentive. We'll call it what he is. That's what he is. (laughs) That is what he is. But thank you. I am so grateful that my wall makes you have a jazzy, more like jazzed up day. That's fantastic. Well, Well, thank you for taking the time again to be able to join us today. You are in the midst of kind of this huge transition and making big tidal waves, I think, that are so important in our industry. And so I would love for you to share a little bit about, like, what, how did Dana get to the point where she is now? Um, And then we can go into this wonderful wave that you're creating that I think is so impactful. You know, it's funny. My first response is like, I don't know. I want to be like, how did I back up? And, do it? Um, and it's so funny because I was literally thinking about um, this the other day. I was talking to one of my first, uh, my first boss when I was in banking, and we were just talking about even just both of our our journeys um, in our careers. And it's just like looking back to this aha moment of all the things that you feel like you wanted to do and wanted to accomplish, and still feeling like you're not done yet. Like there's still so much mm-hmm. to do, although you've actually done quite a bit and having an appreciation for that. Uh, but no, I mean, I graduated from college and it was just like, okay, at that point, you know, 
early 2000s, 2006, it was still that, you know, you graduate college, you go out and get a good job, right? Get a good job and you go into your career. And it was kind of like, okay, well, what does that look like? Uh, never saw myself in the financial industry, uh, definitely not starting out in uh, banking. I went to school for marketing and it was just like, okay, well, I know that I want to hang my hat in the creative space. I love to just ideate and think and really kind of get down and, and create things and, and draw, not that I'm, you know, an artist, but just kind of visually see things. Uh, but that didn't happen. So I ended up two weeks out getting a job um, in a bank and ended up actually liking it uh, and really <laughs> understand, you know, kind of which is weird. Um, it isn't weird if you've worked in a bank before. That's, that's and like true. There, there's so, and I don't think people understand that there's so many entertaining aspects to a bank. I mean, it's almost like being on Saturday Night Live, but there were always just these really, um, random things that would happen um, inside the bank. So it's like, not only was I learning about money, but I was just kind of people watching. It's, you know, it was kind of like being on Central Park on, on a Saturday and just, you know, seeing all of the different types of people that would come in. But, you know, with that being said, I just really started to learn more about money and, and what it meant to just have it and to just even just kind of going through it and holding it, right? There's something that happens when you do that, right? When you have that relationship with money. And for me, it was like really going down this path of now starting to understand what else happened in the bank, right? Who were all of these people that were coming in for, you know, wealth management appointments or meeting with these investment and financial advisors and all of these, you know, CFPs and all of these different titles and designations that I was coming across and really wanting to know, well, what was going on in these back offices, right? Okay, mm -hmm. like the bank is cool, but now I want to know, you know, what are all these closed doors and all these meetings yeah. about? And I started to do a lot of uh, self-study. So, you know, people have forgotten that Amazon used to sell tech textbooks when they first started, right? And now obviously mm -hmm. they do everything. And I hopped on Amazon and I ordered a couple uh, investment books and I started reading and actually ended up started studying for a lot of my investment exams before I even kind of jumped into that space, but more so because I just wanted to learn and understand. Uh, and then I just started asking more questions and just developing my network. And then literally it just kind of spiraled and 15 years later, <laughs> still kind of being in that space uh, of as advisor because I just love to learn about the industry and then also I was, a, I was a people person. So it's like every time I came into contact with someone, every time I was able to hear their story, whether it was just kind of personal or related back to money, it was just very interesting. And also just the lack of financial guidance that people had that I always assumed. It's like I was in my early 20s and you just assumed that people who you know were doing well had maybe five, six, seven figures in their bank actually knew about money. And I just found out that that was not the case. And I had people coming to, you know, the teller line on days when I would do that, asking me what their routing and account number was. And I would just, it was like this deer in headlights <laughs> look of yeah. how I'm looking at your account and you're asking me these really simplified questions that I assume you should know. And the more I just saw that this was kind of commonplace, it was just like, wow, people really don't understand or have this high-end financial acumen that you just assume that they have because they've been successful in their career but transition into how um, they, you know, continue to make their money work for them. So it was like this aha moment of, wow, people really need help and not just people, but, but women. I started really hearing the stories around women who, you know, were, uh, putting everything around either their spouse, right? Or their spouse kind of handle everything. And they were just kind of left to the wayside and figuring things out either in dire moments or moments where they had to take on that role and not knowing how to do that. So, uh, I mean, it just kind of came full circle for me and wanting to be an advisor and to help people understand who they are with their money and how it's actually impacting all of their uh, lives. And then throughout all of that journey, which is kind of the surface, there was, you know, a, a black woman as an advisor, which was, I realized, an anomaly in the industry um, and, and still is, which is kind of sad to say in 2021. But I just realized that all on my journey, I was always in spaces where there weren't a lot of people that looked like me, especially when I moved out of the bank. And it was just like, well, I know we exist somewhere, but wh where are we? So going down that kind of path really led me me to, you know, be on the side of, uh, of inclusion and really wanting to see a difference made within the industry. 
Yeah, you and I, um, obviously I am a white woman and you are a black woman and we've had very differing experiences, but I noticed the same things from that perspective because we both grew up in retail banking. Mm -hmm. And so you that is like the first step of where diversity and inclusion occurs and we see a more diverse workforce is usually in the retail banking sector. And then I would say probably then maybe like mortgage is mm -hmm. probably a little bit more yeah. um, diverse, but our space of wealth management, holy whiteness. Um, like yeah. I, I, I remember working for my previous firm and, and asking, I said, so when, when are we going to get more people that aren't white? Mm -hmm. And it was like a crickets. And then it was like, well, Shannon, you know, it takes time. It takes time. <laughs> it takes time. And what year was this? <laughs> it's not like it was, you know. The, it was like four or five years ago, Dana. Like it, right. was, it was, we weren't like this, you know, we're, the, yeah. we're, 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 we're trying right. to put pancakes together in the ironwood fire. <laughs> right? Not for the nineties. This is not the eighties. Like th this is, this is the, the here and now times. And, um, and we need, we, and this was before 2020 when mm -hmm. the conversation around diversity and inclusion really has probably taken um, a front seat in a lot of corporations that it maybe hasn't before. And they had made a really big push on women. And I think that that's probably on, in all honesty, why I achieved such a trajectory in my career we, because I was that first diverse recruit mm -hmm. and I use diverse so loosely, um, but I was a female mm -hmm. and I was white and I was easy to recruit into that space because of course they thought before I opened my mouth that I was easy. To, <laughs> oh, she'll be this, you know, pretty woman who will sit there and do what we ask her to do. <laughs> Little it's did they know like I'm the exact opposite of that. <laughs> which is like, I mean, which is like the thing, you know, when they look at um, all of us as women and just assume that we are still supposed to be grateful to be in the room, no matter what your background is, right? It's like we're, I, I mean, it was like the first comfortable step with diversity and even just with that word is now, which is just, you know, I mean, not really sure where it's going or where it's gone, but that first comfort step was to allow women in, right? And not necessarily women of color. Color, but the first right. diverse step was was white women and that's where people felt that comfort level to say now we have diversity right and this is what diversity is and what it's looked like and what and that's what the paint the picture that was painted and I remember when I was at larger firms we <laughs> they took us out to lunch one time all of the women on the floor and it was just like okay which weren't very many of us I think it was maybe like maybe five or six mm -hmm. uh, women advisors I was the only woman of color and it was just like, well, how do we get more women in the industry? And how do we get more, you know, minorities in the industry? And in my head, I'm just thinking you hire them. Like, why did we have to go to lunch to have this conversation? I'll enjoy the free food. <laughs> but it's right. like this conversation isn't really going anywhere after I go back to my desk and then just become frustrated in the fact that we just had this talk and knowing that there's nothing that's going to be done. And it's less about the word of diversity because that part is easy. Like you can hire all day and bring in a diverse workforce. The problem that we have is with inclusion, right? It's like yeah. what happens with the inclusion piece? So you bring individuals in and now it's about are you actually speaking to them when they come into the door, right? How are you kind of changing your hat from we've checked this box on diversity and now it's about, well, making people feel seen and feel heard and feel visible. And that's kind of where we've just left things because that's the part where people are a little more uncomfortable having to step out of their comfort zone and have these conversations with people that they wouldn't probably interact with at all unless they were possibly forced to for whatever reason. And it's like, now we have to kind of crawl out of this, this system of, of being that way, right? And just look at everyone as a person, right? There's probably things that you have in common with this individual, even if you don't share the same background or, or religion or, or whatever the case is, right? It's about how do you just go back to when we were in kindergarten and you saw someone walk in 
and they made a had cool sneakers on it. It was just like, hey, I like your sneakers. Come sit here. <laughs> it's like, which I by the way, you have really awesome sneakers. Oh, Dana. thank you. That was that was the oh, email. Yes, the <laughs> Dana had oh, sent okay. me her headshot, and she has <laughs> awesome Converse. And my response was, "Those are the best kicks ever." Listen, if COVID has taught me nothing, it's that I do not have to wear heels. <laughs> yes. And I was like, the sneaker nation is here. Um, and I also want to thank Kabbala for that as well. She has definitely reimagined uh, the Converse. So, yeah, I'm a high top girl. I, I like high tops. Mm. Um, and, and the more jazzed, the better. Um, yes. So if they are glittery or embellished in any sort of way. Um, I actually have a girlfriend of mine that's looking for like old Air Force ones for me. <laughs> so wow. Oh my gosh. I can okay. have those. Now you're bringing back like, <laughs> like our childhood nostalgia, yes. right? Exactly. Um, for those that are not watching, I'm channeling my inner Madonna with my material girl jacket on today with I am loving pearls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this jean jacket. <laughs> um, you two can have it. It was available on Amazon. Um, <laughs> I thought one of my girlfriends posted it and I was like I'm gonna need that jacket and she's like here's the link and I was like and there it is it's in my it's in my guilty pleasure jean jacket no more suit jackets that was my other thing in COVID I was like I'm, I don't need to wear a suit jacket anymore jean jackets are the new suit jacket for me seriously um, I mean now we can just kind of create our own spaces and do what we want to well, I think that that is really what, where, you know, coming into this conversation too, talking about repurposing the workforce and looking at like, what do we, you know, that conversation that you were brought into from a lunch perspective, well, how do we hire more women and people of color into these roles? Well, you just do it. Like the people that are out there are qualified to do it. And you just have to find them in the right spaces. I remember sitting in a very similar converse, similar conversation. It's funny how we get brought into those conversations. Do you think that, do you think men go out for conversations and they say, how, how do we get more men in the industry? I know, no, no. It, it's like, I can only imagine what those conversations are like. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, I remember holding, this is when I was a manager and I was in a hiring space. And I remember um, with my male counterparts um, having the conversation, their response was, bring me the resume. Not I'll do the work. Not I'll, I'll, look, I'll look for the recruits, which by the way, when you're a manager, the first responsibility is to, to recruit mm -hmm. and maintain the diverse workforce. Not manage for the bottom line. That's also important, but you're, you're like the first line item on our job was to hire, maintain a diverse workforce. Just bring them to me. Bring me their resumes and I'll interview them. That was the response that I got. Rather than like, I will do the work to find, I will make the networks, I will, I will go and 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 recruit and have conversations and build myself out of my comfort zone to be able to find people that might be approachable. Mm -hmm. And then I bring them people and they wouldn't hire them. Yeah, so that's, that's like no one wants to step out and have the actual conversation. And it's so ironic, too, because I feel like just as, you know, speaking for myself, not speaking for all, um, you know, people of color or, or black people in general. But, you know, I've always been in spaces where where I feel like I'm always uncomfortable, right? Like you go or I go to conferences and I would sometimes be the only black woman in the room. And I, you know, you just, it, it just is what it is. And I'm kind of like that chameleon and I can get around get along with, with anybody. I grew up in a very diverse space. So for me, it's not um, something that I feel like I can't do, but it would be appreciative of seeing more, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like, I'm always stepping into that space where there's not people that look like me and you just kind of go in and sometimes you just get numb to it where you don't even notice. But mm -hmm. what you do notice is when you see someone that looks like you and you're just like, oh my God, and you're having like this whole unicorn experience, both of you, <laughs> or however right. many are and and you're kind of like okay that head nod and you kind of meet off to the side like let's make sure we're very intentional about getting each other's information and staying in contact but it's like those types of environments are all the time 
even if you go to, or at least, and, and sometimes it, it happens now where there's a lot of conversations around diversity and inclusion, but no one on the stage or having that conversation is is included from any diverse backgrounds, right? It's still, you know, a lot of white men on on these stages having these conversations, not even sometimes having any women on the stage. I think we're starting to get better about that because people are demanding it because how can you have these conversations without the reflection on the stage and even in the audience? Um, so it's something that we're starting to see change because people are just tired, myself included, right? Uh, but, you know, again, it's like we're always out here being uncomfortable, being in these spaces where we're typically by ourselves or we go to events and we know that we're probably not going to see any other person of color, maybe one or two sprinkled um, in there. But on the reverse side of that, you know, you're always invited to these spaces. It's just a matter of taking the time to step out of yourself to go. Like just because something is for maybe a Black affinity group or a Latinx affinity group, yeah or any other affinity group doesn't mean that you can't walk into the room and learn or just walk into the room and just meet some people, right? No one's saying that you can't come. It's just about getting out of your comfort zone to really understand um, what that feels like, number one, and then also just how you start conversations. It's like going back to that age of being in, you know, kindergarten where we would just walk up to people for whatever, you know, reason that was just that innocence of being a kid and having a conversation. And, and that's kind of what we really need to get back to for people to just not feel so uh, in intimidated, right? And still hold all these stereotypes that, that they hold on to, which is, you know, just not changing anything. <laughs> We're making no. things worse. Yeah, and and when we don't create a, a, a cohesive space to be able to have those conversations and learn, and I think a lot of times it's, you mentioned getting into the room, and I think sitting back and listening. Mm -hmm. This isn't like you, as a white person, if you enter into a space of an infinity group, it is not your place to talk. It is right. your place to listen and learn. And with, with open ears and not listen to respond, but listen mm -hmm. to actually engage and hear what those experiences have been. Um, and I think that that proves like a whole nother set of challenges too. I only know this as a woman, um, but I can bet, I bet, I bet you can have had the same experience of sitting in a room where you're meeting with a client mm -hmm. and they, you might have a male counterpart who's not even as qualified as you in yes. the room. Lord knows. <laughs> and that client is staring at them. Mm -hmm. I will never forget. I, I used to work at a, in a partnership and my previous partner is so badass. I love him to death. Um, and he is the whitest looking white guy you've ever met in your entire life, but he is not married to a white woman. And no one would ever guess that by looking at him from the outside. <laughs> His wife is non-white. Okay. Um, but we're sitting in a room and that happened and he stopped the client and said, I am not the qualified individual in this room. That is Shannon. Shannon is answering these questions and you need to listen to her. And um, I had never had that happen to me in my career before that time. And um, because so many of those situations happen for us that because there is a concentrated space where wealth is, I got asked, you know, how many of your clients who are in the wealth management space are white? And I had to say, um, in my clients who are above 250,000 in investable assets, all my clients are white. And that is, there's a concentration in that space, which also not only are advisors experiencing a workforce place, but they're also experiencing it from a client's health standpoint too. But I will say we're going into this wealth switch over the next 30 years. There is going to be wealth transitioning into more women and more black and brown folks than there ever has been, which is why it's so necessary for us to have adequate representation in our industry of, of everyone, right? Yeah. From all different backgrounds, race, religion, whatever, you know, sexual orientation so that we can help people repurpose that wealth for good. What does that look like in your dream that you are, are living out right now? 
Yeah, I mean, there is just this global shift that's happening that some people still want to fight, ignore, and pretend it's not going to happen. And I mean, that's probably the worst place to sit in. And just to go back real quick to your colleague who made that, you know, statement. I mean, those are the things that we need to have happen, right? We can't just do this on our own as as people of color, as Black people, as Latinx or, or whatever your background is. And even just as a woman, like we need men as allies to stand up for us when we're in the room and more specifically when we're not in the room, right? You have to be able to, you know, to check those people who are still acting and behaving and speaking in a manner that's not uplifting women or diverse individuals or people of different sexual orientations. You know, you have to stand up and say something. And this is not the space where we can continue to be silent or just say, oh, well, this is just how this person is. And they don't really mean that way. It's just like, no, explain to them why this is wrong. And coming from someone that looks like them is going to have more of an impact than me saying it, right? It's going to be coming from a less defensive um, space. And it's extremely important to have those those allies. And as we shift to more of this multicultural um, society uh, as professionals and also as consumers, I, I mean, it makes such a world of difference to look across the table and know that here is someone who, who looks like me, or if they don't look like me, they just understand and they're more empathetic, right? There's something about being able to say, hey, I understand and to listen, right? We talked a lot, well, you mentioned a lot about how important it is to sometimes be in the room and just listen and not judge and not perceive. And that's what keeps a lot of consumers out, especially consumers of color sometimes, is that we feel like we have to walk into this room with this entire shield up and also be, you know, make sure we have on our educated face and our suit and tie so that we're not looked at in a certain way, right? If we're <laughs> coming into the bank, it's just not necessarily like the sweats and the sneakers are going to get us a certain look where we're looked at, oh, this person's coming in to cash a check. No, oh, by the way, I actually have a couple hundred thousand in my bank account, but you've never taken the time to ask because maybe I've always come in on a Sunday in my sweats and my sneakers and someone has just assumed, right? So it's like kind of getting out of that space because these are all going to be these uh, the next version of wealth creators and wealth generators for their families. Uh, and if people really don't start looking at these individuals in that way, I mean, they're just, their businesses are going to be non-existent because, you know, the, <laughs> the money that you have now and the clients that you have now, I, I mean, it's just not going to be sustainable over a certain period of time. If you're not really open to being more empathetic, to listening, to just really being inclusive, um, it's just, you know, the world in general, and especially in this industry is just going to change and it's going to change whether or not you want to change with it, <laughs> you know, just like anything else, but consumers are, they're smarter and they want to, they want to talk about their money. They know about what's going on. I mean, we've been through a lot these past couple of years. And I mean, these, these kids, um, who are now growing up, uh, up are having more of these conversations. They're online, they're in front of their gadgets, and you have to be able to, to speak to them and not treat them in the way uh, that you, you, you know, you don't understand that their culture, you're not respectful of their culture or who they are as a person and who they perceive themselves uh, to be. You have to be understanding of that. And you know, it, it's just, it's, there's a lot that's just going to have to change <laughs> right? in people's mindsets in general it is going to have to change along with it. Yeah. And I, I, I would, um, I would phrase a question for you, like, how do we create some of that change too? Cause I think that we also have, we've talked about this, like a level of education that needs to be provided. And when this episode airs, it's going to be financial literacy month. I really don't like that word. <laughs> I like, like, cause I feel like it implies that we're illiterate um, when it comes to it. And we're all very smart individuals. Like you shared earlier about these, these people who you were like, I would have assumed you knew this based on X, Y, and Z. And we both have probably had very successful individuals who have sat at their de our desks embarrassed because they didn't know anything about mm -hmm. their financial picture. So how do we like, as advisors, we're not order takers. We're here to be able to provide advice and guidance. How do we, how do we address those things that are happening with, you know, wealth coming in and 
you know, higher incomes and wages being earned, but we don't have that level set of knowledge. How do we, how do we build upon that? How do we show up differently in a yeah. digital era too? Cause I know you, I know you, I know you like the, <laughs> I know you like the tech, Dana. I mean, we have to, you know, we have to go where, where people are and meet them where they are and not, I mean, I, I think half the battle is just simply showing up. Like a lot of us aren't really, we're, we're not showing up, right? We're not showing up where where they are. We're not helping them to see themselves differently, right? We're still looking at certain people in certain communities as they were many years ago, right? And that's still these, these stereotypes. And, and it takes a lot of self-reflection and it's less sometimes about the other person. It's more about the people on the receiving end. How are you going to change, right? So it's like the question almost kind of get flipped in reverse. And how are you going to change to um, really appreciate and include this next generation? Because this next generation, they're already ready. They're already, for the most part, really inclusive, super diverse, very respectful, very mindful, extremely open and wanting to pour in to individuals who are willing to pour back into them. So it's not, it's not necessarily always about what they're going to do, but it's also about how we're going to reflect in ourselves and, and be ready to receive them and, you know, just make a pathway for that to happen. And whether that is, you know, going into these local communities and seeing how you can volunteer uh, your time or how can you give back or how can you take that time to set aside if you're a firm to, to walk into and build partnerships with, you know, HBCUs, uh, historically black colleges and universities and build some type of program there where you can cultivate these relationships, right? You don't always have to do this with all of the schools um, that are predominantly white, that are well known, that are kind of a part of your network and your alumni sphere, kind of get out of that and kind of go to them, right? And make that partnership known and felt and not just by dollars, but ac by actually by presence. You know, people mm -hmm. have to see things reflected in order to know that, hey, this is something that I can do, which also, you know, brings us back to that visibility in access, right? It's like this entire career path is one that many people don't even know that they can be exist. Yeah. Right. People don't even know that this is really a career. It's like you go out of college um, and it's more of like the corporate financial structure and those types of positions where it's maybe, you know, I banking or investment banking. And you kind of walk that path and that journey and more of the corporate operational side of finance. But people can be very successful on the advisory side, but it's also just being introduced to it in a way that is shown through the, through the reflection of them seeing themselves and seeing people that look like them in these roles. So as, you know, as firms, as professionals, even if it's just you, what can you do to ensure that you are reflected, right? What is your give back and what is the impact that you want to leave uh, in this industry and for your practice and just for the future, um, you know, benefit of this entire world? So it, it's a lot of questions on, you know, what that person wants to do and how they're going to do it and just going and, you know, how you can possibly use technology to do those things. Because we know that, you know, a lot of people are tech tech savvy, right? And it's just like, you're going to get beat out in some way, shape or some way, shape or form. Uh, it's kind of like when the industry was kind of moving to include more tech, right? And people were fighting for e-signatures and they didn't want to do the, these simple things, right? But it's like, you cannot fight things. Um, <laughs> it's just going to happen. And so, how could we have gotten through the last year of processing I, paperwork listen, if we didn't have e -signature? Oh my goodness, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's just like these old, uh, you know, ways of, of thinking are just, I, I mean, they're gone. And, and if you want to continue to be, um, in this business or just, you know, be a part of this really global shift in this world change. And you're, you're going to have to get comfortable with really being uncomfortable. And as cliche as that is, you're going to have to do it. Uh, and it's so interesting too, because I just finished reading um, Power Up, which is the most amazing a book I've ever read. Uh, well, one of the most amazing books I've ever read. I'm turning around because I'm trying to remember um, the author. I think it's Men Mandela. I feel like I'm just butchering that, but power up. It just really talks about as, as women, how we need to own our own um, power and be unapologetic and walking in certain spaces and all the things that we were talking about before, um, just even roll into this conversation now about how and what we're going 
uh, to do to move forward. And having these allies and having these conversations uh, is really one of the ways we do that. And also just, you know, making sure that we're all, we're all stepping into our own power unapologetically. Yes. <laughs> and power isn't, um, isn't something that we use for, for control. I think that yeah. that's a, a word that's always yeah. been, that some people have struggled with. Um, I've always found it very, like, I love that word. And it's never been something for me where I, I use it as a control mechanism. Actually, I'm using it to use my voice mm -hmm. for others to be able to be heard. Like for me, I've always been like, hey, shut up. This person's trying to talk. Like, do you hear yeah. them in the back row? They got a question. Mm -hmm. You are talking over them. Um, but I think that's initiating some of that. It's funny that you bring up that book because I literally just got off a phone call with another woman who runs an amazing business and she just was talking about the same oh exact book. Yeah. And her teenage daughter had brought it home and she was like, I had to stop her from reading the book so that we could read it together so that she didn't use her power tactics against <laughs> me without me knowing what her power tactics I mean, it's were. literally that kind of book. I feel like she's going to need to send me a t-shirt because now I'm going to get on the, <laughs> the train of the team of just just selling this for her. But it, it really was, it was, a, it was hard to put down. Um, and it's a really good read, a quick read. And the story is just amazing, but it does start to remind you of who you are, right? Like you, you do, I mean, as women, we have this power that we sometimes hold back because we don't wanna be looked at as, you know, being aggressive or, or all of these things that come with being a woman or being, you know, afraid to talk about, you know, that what it looks like to be a mother, to be a wife and how, you know, other people will think, oh my God, now that you're going down this path, your career is over, right? It just mix in, mixes in so many uh, different things that we forget that are strong points about us as women. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if you haven't read it, it I highly suggest <laughs> it's a great, great book. This is Dana um, linking it to her bio <laughs> and telling everybody that this is not a book to read. Um, <laughs> actually, I'll, I'll put a link, I'll put a link to the book in, um, in the show notes and um, in the blog so people can. Um, I love, I love books. I love being able to share those things. Now we've kind of glossed over um, and haven't really rolled up our sleeves and, and, and talked about chip which is uh, the, the technology that you have really taken to create waves in our industry. Let's talk about that because I think our audience is gonna be so intrigued by this. And with the caveat that I would also say advisors who feel like they might lose business because they bring other advisors in that don't look like them, is a fallacy. You are building an industry that creates more opportunity for more people to build wealth, um, both those that are working in the industry and those that serve. So I just wanted that caveat before we go into the conversation. No, and thank you for that. Um, because I think that point is very important because there's this other side that looks at it that way, almost this kind of of how, how dare you, right? How, how dare you kind of step into it in that way? But CHIP is really about bringing that visibility and ease of access to a group of finance professionals who for the most part haven't really been seen or been heard. Uh, so we have a hyper focus right now on Black and Latinx finance professionals to ensure that they are at, you know, for the first time really at the forefront. And it, it, it's important, right? It's important for all of the reasons that we talked about before, um, not just for those to see themselves reflected who are already in the industry, but those who are thinking about wanting to be in this industry, right? How do I know that I can even be successful if I don't see anyone who's been successful or who's actually doing it represented somewhere? Uh, and it's also about the consumer base, right? So, I mean, any consumer of any kind can obviously go to CHIP and find a qualified professional outside of the fact that we, we have this hyper focus on Black and Latinx right now, but it's important just to be looked at as a financial professional. But the visibility and the ease of access is extremely important for consumers who want to come to the table and also see themselves reflected, right? Because to some degree, um, you know, people of color have kind of been ignored when it comes to wealth creation. Absolutely. 
it's just been, you know, you live in, in banking and in credit or, or debt, and that's kind of where we've lived. And that's where, and, and that's on quotations, and that's where we, what we've been marketed to. And now to have this shift where we're, we're really starting to see ourselves as wealth creators and wealth generators, and even what it means to just tie that word back to our communities for so many who are, who might be starting out, who are actually doing well and just kind of need the help to continue to do well. Well, and some who are in that high net worth space, who if you know anything about that space and what it looks like now, it's it's still very saturated with the the old um, Wall Street look of, of white men, right? There's still mm -hmm. not a lot of black and brown financial advisors reflected in that high net worth space. So if you're in that space, to some degree, you have to, to work with who's around you. And if you really want to be intentional about working with someone who looks like you, you really have to kind of seek that out. Uh, and to some degree, it's it just hasn't really um, it hasn't really been there. And our and our goal is to really work alongside firms of of all sizes and and RIAs and other professionals and organizations who have also been putting in the work for years. Uh, before we've even come to the table, but it's not just, you know, chip is like a small part <laughs> of the pie, right? It's like, it's this really, um, you know, shift in what everyone can do together because that's how change happens. But, you know, chip was, or, or really is, um, I think at the forefront of something amazing that needs to happen and has needed to happen for a very long time. So to be able to uh, empower and support and really just see people that look like me doing really well in this industry and wanting to highlight them and also ensure that these consumers are seen differently, the stereotypes start to go away and we just kind of change the narrative on both sides is, is game changing. And I mean, and, and it's just something that has to exist in this world in some way, shape or form. So it was just like, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, know, my, my reason um, and my why and my, my wanting to be uh, very impactful in this space. So yeah, I mean, and Chip is really here to, to just stay, right? It's just like, we're, we're here to, to change the story so that the story that I keep telling is not one that is told by another professional in the next, you know, three to five to 10 years, right? There's, there, there's a story, there's stories that need to die at some point. So I couldn't, I couldn't agree more um and i i just love that we can we can get behind things and we can say things but when we take action is when real change begins to happen right yeah. um and, and and of course you know starting with um with being able to for those individuals who are you and i said this um on a panel that we just spoke at, on you know welcome to the party the beer is warm um but we will will happily serve it to you um, so talking about it is good, but being able to create action is, is the piece that actually does really create that level of change and help individuals who used to tell me uh, it takes time um, to really say, you know what, we actually already have these qualified individuals who are here. They're just being ignored, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so how do we find them? <laughs> how do we find them and how do we how do we make sure that they're accessible to individuals because like you said too um for so often I, I wrote a, a paper about this in in college about how we advertise differently um both from a food standpoint as well as a financial standpoint uh in different spaces and I um I use the Twin Cities as a specific place because we have South Minneapolis and North Minneapolis that are concentrated areas of color. I grew up in South Minneapolis. I spent a lot of time on the North side um, because I had friends that lived there. And, uh, and frankly, I went to high school like smack dab in the middle. So we all kind of hang out in different spaces. Um, but that element of looking at those spaces and then transitioning and looking at, you know, predominantly white spaces who had Wall Street banks who were on the corner who are talking about savings rates, um, who are talking about investing in real estate and building wealth. On the flip side, there were payday loan ads um, and paycheck loan yeah. providers at the front door. Like there was nothing mentioned about wealth producing um, vehicles to be able to create change. And so I think that conversation is necessary 
as well as we continue to create change, how do we create change from those elements of things as well? Um, starting with making sure we have people that look like people. <laughs> exactly. Making that sure are going to be carrying wealth. Yeah. Um, and and, not, like, and yeah. not in a token element. I feel like we could literally keep talking about this all day long. Um, yeah, there's so and, many layers to it. And I mean, what you just said is like a whole nother uh, episode. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. You can't hire somebody just for that space. And I think we spent a lot of time on the hiring part. Maybe we'll have to do another episode on like the culture that we create. Um, Cause we can hire people, but people stay because of the culture that we create. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that retention piece is, is key and is, you know, the, the bigger problem, right? The hiring is super easy. The retention is, yeah, that, that, that we need, we need work. Got to do work. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll have to do a whole nother episode just on that piece and creating culture. Maybe we have to do, I don't know, a regular episode together or something. That would be fun. Hey, I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to have to step up my background. <laughs> I have to like get, do something. Um, I will send you some paint samples <laughs> and we can get the color choices made. You just, well, the red looks really good on you with the Thank lipstick. You. So maybe you pick like, I don't know, a red accent wall or something. I, yeah, maybe that's maybe what I got. I don't know. This is, I'm just a very, I, so my parents are artists. Like I grew up, when I told my parents I was going to be in the financial industry, they were like, I'm sorry, what? You're going to do what? Yeah, like, oh, you're going to actually like make money? Oh, wow. Um, and it's also raised by two starving artists as well. So <laughs> it ends up being a very different situation. But I am so grateful for you to take the time today and share your wisdom. Um, with our audience and listeners, where can people follow along? We will, of course, link Chip in um, the blog and in the show notes so that people can um, explore and utilize the services that you are providing. But where else can people hang out and, and keep in contact with Dana as um, this grows and this journey evolves? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. This has been such an amazing conversation and yes, more to come. But yeah, people can find um, Chip at chipprofessionals.com. You can find us on Instagram at chipprofessionals. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Dana Disrupts. I'm trying to do better about the whole Twitter situation. So I'm, <laughs> I'm getting I it. love Dana Disrupts. That's yeah, great. Dana Disrupts. I don't do Twitter very well either. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at that. Uh, and then I also have a podcast called The Included Series which you can find anywhere that you get your um, podcast. Yeah, well, fantastic. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, and please, uh, listeners, make sure that you tune in because uh, you, you, you heard her here, but she's going to be, um, there are no glass ceilings. So I can't wait to see where, where you take all of this. <laughs>